All right. It's good to see you guys. We overcame the plague of Omicron. Uh, still feel a little fatigue and stuff, but overall we're doing really good. Man, we missed being here for Christmas Eve and all that. That was a bummer, but it's good to be back. Um, I uh, was watching... I, well, actually, I heard somebody say one time, and that got me, got me watching these videos on YouTube. It seems like a lot of my sermon intros, I think about videos on YouTube. But uh, uh, I heard somebody say one time that in life, there's a lot of good starters, but not a lot of finishers. And that kind of stuck with me, and I think that's true. You know, like, there's going to be a lot of people who start things, but uh, somewhere along the way, a lot of people fall off, and there's not a lot of people who finish what they start, you know? So I was watching these videos on YouTube of bad finishers, and it's just interesting. Like, there's this guy who caught a football pass, and he's running to the touchdown, and he starts bragging and running backwards and stuff, and then he gets tackled right before he gets to the touchdown. And <laughs> there's some other people who, like, they would run, and they thought they'd won the race, and so they throw their hands up, you know, and hit that drag in the wind, and then someone else will blow right past them. Oh, man, there's just one girl. She lost a bronze medal because she thought she had it, and then somebody blows right past her, and she was like, oh, you know, it was really sad. Um, and uh, I think around this time of year, it's good to talk about, well, it's just really neat, actually, how this worked out, because I'm preaching through Second Timothy, right? And this will probably, it might be, I might have one more sermon, but this is like one of the last sermons in Second Timothy, right? So we're at the end, and this is the end of Paul's life. And I thought it was really interesting that at the beginning of the year, first sermon of the year, I'd be talking about the end of Paul's life. Because like Scott was saying, we, a lot of people around this time of year make New Year's resolutions. They make a plan. They're going to start something, right? But I think what we need to learn is not just how to start things, but how to finish well, right? And so as I was reading this passage, there's things popping out to me in Paul that showed me why he was able to finish, you know? With all the stuff that Paul went through, how did he finish well? And I want to bring those out for us, because as we begin this year, as we think about starting or turning over a new leaf or whatever it is that we've made a resolution about, we need to have these principles in us so that we can finish well, not just start well, right? There's this, y'all know the Navy SEAL bell? Anybody ever heard of the Navy SEAL bell? When you go into Navy SEAL boot camp, they say only like 25 to 35 percent of people who try to be a Navy SEAL actually make it. And if you're going to quit, there's this bell in the middle of the camp, and you got to go ring it three times and take your helmet and set it on the ground by the bell. And that's how you officially volunteer out of the Navy SEALs, <laughs> is what they call it. Uh, and we don't want to do that. We don't want to be people who start and don't finish. And so what can we learn from Paul about how to finish well? That's what we're going to look at today. So if you got your Bible, go to 2 Timothy 4. And we're going to start in verse 6. 2 Timothy 4, verse 6. If you've been following along with the sermons, Paul's been telling Timothy all kinds of good stuff for ministry, and now he's wrapping it up, right? This is the end of the letter. And this is what he says, starting in verse 6. He says, I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And henceforth, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who loved his appearing, who have loved his appearing. And like I said, Paul was somebody who finished well, right? Like when this is probably the last letter he wrote, one of the last things he wrote to Timothy, and he's looking back over his life and he's saying, I have finished well, I've kept the faith. And Paul went through stuff that like, we can't imagine, most of us, right? He was beaten, he was shipwrecked, he traveled all the time, he had people betray him, he was stoned. And one thing that stood out to me, uh, we were reading through the Bible and we were watching these videos, and something I didn't realize is how much time Paul spent in prison. Like, he spent years in prison. You know, you kind of think of it as like, he spent six months here, six months there, but like at the end of the book of Acts, he'd been in prison for like, what, four, five years by the end of the book of Acts, just in prison waiting for a trial with Caesar. And this letter, we don't know if it's at the end of the book of Acts, like that one time he was in prison or if he got out and then got into prison again. But the point is he was in prison a lot, right? But somehow through it all, 
he remained faithful. He finished well. And so I'd like to look at this stuff with you. Let's figure out some things. And I want to say we're not going to find everything in here for how to finish well. There's more than just what we're going to talk about today. But there's some good things in here I think will be good for us. And honestly, I want you all to know, you know, I hope this sermon is interesting to you all and you enjoy it. But this has been a really good sermon for me to study because there's been some things that I want to quit lately, you know? There's been some things that I'm kind of tired of doing. And this has been a good sermon for me, so I hope it is for you too. The first thing I think that's good for us to remember if we're going to finish well is we need to remember that we're called to fight. We need to remember that we are in a battle. Look at what Paul says here. Look at the way he describes his life, okay? He says, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. When you look at those words, that word fight, it means to be in, engaged in Olympic games, to wrestle, to strive. What does it say? The actual definition is to endeavor with strenuous zeal, okay? This is like when you're putting it all out on the court. You're really pushing. And the idea of keep is to watch over something carefully, right? And so I think one of the first things to realize if we're going to finish well is we've got to have the right mindset about our life. Paul, didn't, Paul wasn't on vacation with Jesus, right? Like when he looked at his life, he's like, this is a battle. I am in this to fight. I think some of the reasons people get discouraged in the Christian walk, I think some of the reasons people quit is because they didn't sign up for a lifetime battle pass, you know? They get into the middle of things and they're like, I didn't sign up for this, you know? Especially when you start to try and honor God where there's been strongholds in your life, and then you get hit with resistance, you know? You have things coming at you out of nowhere that seem totally unexpected, and you're like, God, what's the deal, you know? I'm trying to serve you. Why is my life so hard? And it's because people don't realize, or they're not thinking about the fact that when they signed up to follow Jesus, they signed up to be a soldier and to fight, right? When you seek to follow Jesus, it's going to be hard. And if you don't have that mindset, you're going to get burned out and frustrated because it's hard, right? Uh, And Paul had this mindset. He's like, I am in it to fight. He understood what he signed up for. Has anybody ever read uh, Pilgrim's Progress? Um, Cool book. I think I read the kid version. I don't know if I read the adult version, but... (laughs) But anyways, right when Christian becomes a Christian, or this dude named Christian, he's living in the city of destruction, he gets the book, the Bible, he becomes a Christian, um, I think, or he's just about to become a Christian. But anyways, he's starting to go down the road of life, right? And there's this couple guys who come with him for a little way, and then one of them's like, oh, this is awesome, because Christian tells him, hey, at the end of this road, there's a beautiful city. We're going to have rewards. There's going to be life. And this guy's name is Pliable, okay? And he's like, oh, that sounds awesome. I want to go with you. And so he starts walking with Christian down the road of life. And they don't get very far before they hit the slough of despond. You all remember that? And Christian's got this big old burden. And they're in the middle of this muck. And they're sinking. They don't realize there's steps down the middle of it. And so they're like sinking. And Pliable gets in there. And he's like, what the heck, Christian? Like, you said this was going to be awesome. What is this? Right? And Christian doesn't know what to tell him. And so Pliable gets out off in the side, and he goes back to the city of destruction. He's like, forget this. Right? And that's what this makes me think about, is like, some of us need to remember, if we're going to finish well, that not some of us, all of us need to remember, if we're going to finish well, we're in a fight. This is a battle. You didn't sign up for taking it easy with Jesus 101. You signed up for a battle, a spiritual battle that we're in until the day we die, right? And if we have this mindset, it helps us get through the tough times, recognizing what we signed up for. And it's important that we have this mindset because the world around us is seeking to draw us away from God. Look at this. This is really interesting. In verse 9 of 2 Timothy 4, it says, Do your best to come to me, For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Now, this is really interesting because Paul had a friend named Demas, okay? And he's actually mentioned two other times in two other letters in the Bible. And he's one of, Paul calls him his fellow laborer in the book of Philemon. So Demas is somebody that traveled with Paul, worked with Paul. He was somebody that Paul trusted. 
But here, at the end of his life, we don't know why, we don't know what went down, but something pulled Demas away. And Paul says he's fallen in love with this present world, and he's deserted me in prison. He's gone to Thessalonica. And I think we need to understand, if we're going to make it to the end, is not only is this a battle, but the battle we are in is a battle where the devil is trying to draw our love and affection away from Jesus to things that aren't as important. That's the battle we're in, right? Demas is somebody who served Jesus, but somewhere along the line, he got drawn away from the things that really mattered, and he deserted Paul and fell in love with the present world. We, you know, the Bible calls the devil the prince of this world, or Jesus called the devil the prince of this world. And look at this. The Bible says that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So when you study it, it's like this. The world was good. Humanity let the devil and sin into the world. And now the, wor- the devil is working in the world behind the scenes to raise up things that are opposed to God. It's what the Bible calls the Antichrist, or the spirit of the Antichrist, okay? Look at this in uh, 1 John. It says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, it's not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. And look at this. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know it is the last hour. We've kind of gotten it weird in our end times theology that's popular nowadays. People think of the Antichrist as this one guy that's going to rise up, and he's going to you know, take over the world and be a bad guy, right? And whether or not that's true, the real definition of Antichrist is anything that is opposed to God. It talks about later in 2 John, the Antichrist is the spirit that denies that Jesus came in the flesh. It's the spirit that denies Jesus, right? And so the devil is working in the world. He's working in the institutions, in the entertainment industry, in the politics, in everything. He's working to to bring systems up that deny Jesus and deny his lordship in the world. Does that make sense? The, the spirit of the Antichrist is what is in the world. And that spirit with the devil... Um, oh, well, look at this first, so it makes sense. So the Bible says um, that the spirit in the world, because of Jesus, we overcome it. So look at this. It says, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So we have hope. Even though the devil is working in this world, God has helped us to overcome it. But even though we have been delivered from the world and from what the devil is trying to do in the world, the devil is still trying to pull each of us back into love with the world. He is trying to pull each of us with the desires of our flesh. This often, when you look at it in the Bible, it speaks to sensual desires, often sexually immoral desires. It's linked to the goddess Aphrodite, right, that the pagans used to worship. There's the desire of the eyes. This is the desire for things, for stuff, for money, for possessions. It's linked to the god Baal. That's what people would get if they worship Baal was possessions and money. It's linked to the pride of life. And this is the desire for power and prestige, and it's associated with the pagan god Molech. You worship Molech to gain power, right? This is the temptations of the world. The devil is constantly trying to draw people with the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, or the pride of life. He's like, hey, if you follow me, I will give you everything your flesh desires. If you follow me, I will give you power, prestige, possessions, right? These are the temptations we face In the world. That's what the devil's been doing for a long, long time. He did it to Jesus. Do you remember the temptation in the wilderness where the devil tempts Jesus three times? First of all, he says, Make these stones into bread. He takes the one desire that was foremost in Jesus' body, fleshly desire, to eat. He hadn't eaten in 40 days. And the devil's like, Look, just disobey God. Make these stones bread. Don't wait on God anymore. Do it yourself. He tempts the Jesus with the pride of life. He says, throw yourself off the temple. 
and the angels will bear you up. And that hidden temptation is everyone will see that you're the son of God and they will exalt you and worship you. All you have to do is throw yourself off the temple, right? And then the last one, the uh, lust of the eyes, he says, just bow down and worship me and I will give you all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. That's how he tempted Jesus with the desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, the pride of life. That's how he tempts us. Each of us are in the middle of a battle where the devil is trying to draw you away from Jesus and he's going to do it with these temptations right here. If you just compromise, if you just do what the temptation is drawing you to do and you turn away from Jesus, you will get the lust of the flesh, you'll get the lust of the eyes, you'll become prestiged, people will respect you. This is what Jesus warned about in the parable of the sower says, he's talking about three different kinds of seeds. In the third seed, it said it was sown among thorns. And this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. And again, it's not like all these things are bad. Having things isn't bad. Being uh, someone who is in a powerful position isn't bad. But it's always, the temptation is always to prioritize these things more than your relationship with Jesus. It's always to put your job before Jesus so that you can get more money. It's always to put something before Jesus so that you can get this desire you want, but Jesus gets put on the back burner. That's the temptation. And that is the battle we are in. And you need to realize, like, I feel like um, our culture, especially in our culture, we are inundated with the idea that we should focus on ourselves. It's so immersive in our culture that we, we don't even think about it, you know? It's like the older you get, you should focus on your retirement. It's like, I'll serve Jesus until I'm 50 or 60, but then it's me time, right? Or everything is just wrapped around focusing on our lives. And again, like I said, it's not like any of these things are bad. Retirement isn't bad. It's just put it first. Focus on this before Jesus. If we, if you don't think that the devil is fighting to steal your affection from Jesus, to burn out your fire, to get you to be somebody who goes to church but doesn't really love Jesus with all your heart, if you don't think that's happening, then you've been deceived. Because, see, I think another reason it's important to remember we're in a battle is because the Christian life is often a day-to-day grind, right? Like, a lot of young people fall into the desire for signs and wonders. They want to they have this explosive, amazing relationship with Jesus where every day they're walking around and healing people and having God encounters and all this stuff. And that's cool. I'm not against that. But I think where young people fall off the wagon a lot of times is when they grow up and they have to work a nine to five job and life isn't explosions and fireworks with Jesus anymore. It's like, well, this isn't exciting anymore. This isn't fun anymore. And so they start to drift away from their relationship with Jesus. Because the Christian life, we've got to learn, is often a day-to-day walking it out, being faithful with Jesus, right? And what the devil wants to do is in the grind, in the day-to-day, in the boringness of life sometimes, to get us to just sort of lose our fire and our passion for Jesus and begin to prioritize and get distracted with other things that are more exciting. Does that make sense? You all know what I'm saying? I, uh, I think of it like with my hand, like we're, you know, we're supposed to be like a body part of Jesus, right? My hand does a lot of boring things, right? It puts cereal in my mouth. It uh, scratches my head right now. This one's in my pocket. Boring, right? Like what a boring life. Sometimes it gets to do fun things like throw a football or do a Rubik's cube or something. But, you know, a lot of times it's just doing boring stuff, but my hand should never start to say, well, my life is boring. I'm just going to kind of do my own thing, you know? And if my hand starts to get distracted and it's not responding to the head, I'm in trouble, right? And what we need to be is like a hand, like a body part where <laughs> Kevin, <laughs> I don't know why I cracked Kevin up over there, but we need to be like a body part that in the boringness of life, we're attentive to God. We're ready, you know? We are not losing our fire and distracted. We're walking with Jesus in the boring, in the nine to five. I think it's important to remember that we're called to fight in the nine to five, in the day-to-day grind, with the distractions pulling at us constantly. We need to remember. 
I think um, it's good for each of us to come to God and say, God, don't let me lose my fire. Don't let me get distracted with the things of the world. Don't let me drift away from you, you know? God, in my job, in my nine to five, in my day to day grind, help me to stay focused on what really matters. We need that mindset if we're going to finish well. If we don't have it, we're just going to drift. And this is cool because what's neat about the Christian life is you never have to be a Demas if you don't want to. Check this out. So it says, for Demas, back in 2 Timothy verse 10, it says, for Demas in love of this present world has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. He mentions a couple other people here. Crescent has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Look at this. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you. He is very useful to me for the ministry. Now, this is cool because what I'm encouraging all of us to do is to be a Luke. Not me, but Luke the, you know, doctor. Because Luke was faithful. Luke traveled with Paul. And Luke was one of the only people that was with Paul in his imprisonment right now. And he was faithful in the day-to-day, in the grind. He walked with Paul. He walked with Jesus. He was faithful. Even when Demas deserted Paul, he was faithful. And so what I'm encouraging us to do is to be Luke's, to be like this guy here and to stay faithful in the thick and thin in the day-to-day grind, to be passionate about Jesus. But the deal is sometimes we do get distracted. Sometimes we do get off track. And what's cool is even if we haven't been a Luke, we can be a Mark. And this is, I love this. So this guy right here, his name is John Mark, okay? And he was a companion of Paul, and he went with Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey, right? And he was their minister, it says. So he was just along to help out whatever they needed. But some, for some reason, in Acts 13, 13, it doesn't say why. There's just this little weird postscript to the verse that's like, and John left and returned to wherever they were from. And then later in the book of Acts, Paul and Barnabas are going to go on another missionary journey. And we get a little more insight because Barnabas wants to take John again. But Paul says, no, we can't bring him. He said, I don't want to bring the dude that deserted us. It doesn't say the dude, but you know what I mean. I don't want to bring the dude that deserted us on our first missionary journey. And so John is somebody who blew it. I don't know what happened. I don't know if he got discouraged. I don't know if he got bad news from home. But for whatever reason, he said, I can't handle this anymore. I'm leaving. And he ditches the work just like Demas did. He and Demas did the same thing. They abandoned Paul and went to wherever they thought would be better for them. And Paul and Barnabas actually had such an argument over this that they split. It's one of the main main events in the book of Acts. But this is really neat because when you get to 2 Timothy at the end of Paul's life, he's saying, hey, get Mark, bring him with you because he's useful now for the ministry. And what's cool to me about this is something happened with Mark that even though Mark did what Demas did and he deserted Paul, like God wasn't done with John Mark and he worked on John Mark and he helped John Mark grow. And it was so much so that Paul was able to say, hey, I didn't want him to come before, but now he's ready. I see the work that God has done in his life. And what's cool to me about this is like, your, our failures don't determine our future, you know? We can still be people who finish well, even if we've screwed up along the way. Because anytime you get back to God and say, God, I want to do it right. I know I have failures back here, but I want to start over and get right. God is ready to start working on you again, you know? And the book of Mark is in the Bible today because John Mark got back with God and God did a work in his life and John Mark was faithful. He was a Demas, but he became somebody that God could use because our failures don't define our future. Amen? And I love that about God. You see these stories of redemption. Peter and Judas denied Jesus, but Peter was restored and Judas wasn't. It's amazing. And it's like this choice is before you. Even if you've been a Demas, even if you've gotten distracted, derailed, you don't have to stay there. You can be a John Mark. And so I think the first thing, if we're going to finish well, is we need to remember that we're called to fight. We need to know what kind of battle we're in, that the devil is seeking to pull us away, and that we need to fight. And here's the other thing I think, to me, that is really standing out to me. We need to know and trust the love. We need to know and trust Jesus and the love that he has for us. This to me is really important. 
I find a lot of times in my life that I don't believe in myself because I feel like God doesn't believe in me. He doesn't really value what I'm doing. He doesn't really love what I'm doing or value me, you know? And so I get discouraged. It's like, what's the point? Why am I even doing this? And I think knowing and trusting Jesus and the love that he has for you is so important, especially when we go through hard times. Look at this in verse 14 of chapter 4. Paul's talking about his current situation. He says, Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against him. So this is interesting. We don't know all of what's going on here. We can take a guess, but it looks like Paul had a trial. It looks like this Alexander coppersmith dude maybe was part of that. Maybe he got Paul in trouble. That's why we think it could have been a second imprisonment for Paul. But Paul had a defense. No one came to stand by him to help him for whatever reason. I don't know where Luke was. And he was deserted. And it doesn't look like it went well because Paul is saying, like we just read, the, my end is coming. I'm, I'm about to leave. I have fought a good fight. I'm ready. I'm about to get out of here. And so he's alone. His enemies are coming for him. He had no one to defend him. And what stands out to me here is this, I feel like would have been really easy for Paul to get frustrated at God and be like, man, I've served God my whole life. I've honored him. And here I am. And this is what I get. But Paul didn't lash out at God like that because he knew God. And that's the thing to me is like Paul never blame God for what was happening. And that wasn't because he was a super saint. It was because he had learned that God really, really cared about him and was there for him. Look at what he says at the beginning of this letter. Again, he's talking about his suffering. He says, for which, talking about the gospel, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher, and this is why I suffer as I do, but I'm not ashamed. Why? Because I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Going back to that verse in chapter four, this is what he says about his trial. He said, the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the preaching might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. And the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. So even in this like big trial he's going through, at the end of his life, deserted, the enemies are coming for him, he knows this is the end, he's probably going to be martyred, he has no doubt about God. He is totally trusting Jesus. And man, that is what we need. Um, I, uh, look at what he says here in the book of Ephesians. This is really cool. Paul is praying for the Ephesian church, and he um, is kind of wrapping up a whole long passage. And this is like the pinnacle of his prayer. He's like, I am bowing my knees before the Father for this, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named, that according to the riches of glory, he would grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner man. Why? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. This is a fancy way of saying, I'm praying for you that you would be strengthened to trust God, that Jesus could feel at home in your heart, that there wouldn't be any doubt, any any dissimulation, that you would be implicitly trusting Jesus and Christ could have his home there in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge. This is what Paul is praying for the church. And it makes sense. When you are going through the darkest night of your life, you need to know two things above all else, that God loves you and that you can trust him through this. And it is exactly what the devil will attack when you're going through a hard time. You can't trust God and he doesn't love you. That's why you're going through this, right? And this isn't something you can just convince somebody and say, I could stand here and say, hey, you can trust God and God loves you. But that doesn't do anything. This has got to be something that the Holy Spirit does in you where you know you can trust him and you know that he loves you. Faith. 
And that is why I think Paul is praying. He's not trying to cram it down their throat. He's like, look, I know this is what you need above all else to know that you can trust Jesus and that he really loves you, that he's with you through the storm. And so he's getting on his knees and praying. I think this is a great prayer to pray for ourselves and for others. If we want to finish well, we need to pray that God would help us to believe that he is trustworthy and that he loves us, right? When you are going through a hard time in your life, to say, God, I am struggling to feel you. I am struggling to feel like you're there or you care. Help me to believe that I can trust you right now and that you really love me. That's what we need. I think it's, as I have been studying through Ephesians and this part, I started praying that for our church. I was thinking, man, all the stuff people have been going through in our church, what do we need? People in our church need to know that they can trust God right now and that he loves them. Because when you know that, it doesn't matter what you're going through, right? And here's something else to me that really encourages me. The truth is that God doesn't often take us out of the trial, but biblical deliverance is, always a res- is often a rescue through the trial. Look, um, look, if you will, again at verse 10. I don't have it on the screen, but... Um, oh, where is it? I'm sorry, it's verse uh, 18. Look at what it says. It says, The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. What's so interesting about this is Paul went through this trial, and he knows he's probably about to die. But he says, The Lord is going to rescue me. And I think something that we don't realize sometimes is that biblical deliverance is often a deliverance through a trial. It's not a deliverance from a trial. Look at what he says here in 2 Timothy 3.11. He said, My persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. So at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, Paul got stoned twice, I think. He was beaten. I, I forget everything he went through. But he almost died in one of these towns. What persecutions I endured. But look, yet from them all, the Lord rescued me. And when we pray, this word rescue is the word in the Lord's Prayer where it says, deliver us from evil. That's something we're supposed to ask God to do. This biblical deliverance is often not God. When we pray that, sometimes we think it's God taking us out. Here come the bad things and God takes us out, right? But biblical deliverance is often a deliverance through. Paul said, I endured all these things. I went through them and the Lord rescued me out of them. That didn't mean he didn't have to go through it. It means that what the devil wanted to do in that situation didn't happen. The devil wanted to destroy Paul. The devil wanted to stop his ministry. He wanted to discourage him. And God rescued him from that. He went through it all and came out stronger. That's biblical deliverance. This is the way Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians. It says, we're afflicted in every way, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, not forsaken. Struck down, not destroyed. And that's why Jesus prayed this in his high priestly prayer. He says, I'm not asking that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. And I love this hope because it's way more realistic. If we're going to make it to the finish line, if you're hoping that God is just somehow going to rescue you from all the hard things you have to go through and you're going to coast, you are going to be really frustrated, right? But if you know that no matter what you go through, because we live in this broken, sinful world, God is going to rescue you through it, and that the devil will not be able to destroy you in it, that's a hope I can hold on to. When I, if, if you go through cancer, if you go through family death, if you go through pain and difficulty, if you have all these stressors coming at you, God may not take you out of it, but he'll take you through it, and you will come out better on the other side. It's like how... The king Nebuchadnezzar threw the boys into the furnace and they had to go through it, but Jesus was with them in it and they came out and they didn't even smell like smoke, right? It's like how uh, Daniel had to go into the lion's den, but God shut the lion's mouths while he was in there. It's like how some of us have been through some really terrible stuff in our life and God didn't just rescue us out of it, but 
Some of you in here are way stronger than you ever would have been because God has rescued you through it. Amen? This is a biblical hope of deliverance, and that is something we can hold on to. And look at how God delivers us through these. I love this. If you look again at verse 18, it says, The Lord will rescue me or deliver me from every evil work. This is the literal translation of the word. And this is what it literally means. It means to draw to oneself, to rescue, to deliver. This word for rescue, it literally means, Lord, it means save me. And it's, what, it's the same word that Peter cried when he was sinking in the waves, when he was walking on the water, and he begins to doubt, and he begins to sink. He says, save me, rescue me. And Jesus grabs him and pulls him up to himself. And they walk together on the water back to the boat. That's what God does. When you're going through these trials, the way God is going to rescue you is he's going to pull you to himself and walk with you through it till you get to the other side. That is what biblical deliverance is all about. And so I think if we are going to make it to the finish line, we have to remember this is a fight. We're going to go through hard stuff. You following Jesus means that you are going to suffer and that you are going to go through difficult things. And as we go through these difficult things, we need to trust Jesus and his love for us, right? And that's not something we can just force ourselves to do. It's something we should pray and say, God, will you help me to trust you and believe? We should pray it for each other. I'd encourage you when you pray for this church to pray this specifically. God, help us to trust you and help us to believe the love that you have for us. That's what we need. And lastly, I think it's good to remember that through all this battle, all this trial, there's a reward at the end of it. Paul said, here, whoops, I didn't put it up there. 2 Timothy 4, 8, if you go back there. He said, henceforth there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. Man, it's going to be a shock, I think, for some people to die and go to the judgment day and realize they wasted their life on the wrong things. Guys, what we need, I think... What I want to communicate, I, I get worried sometimes in these sermons that I'm sounding like I'm just saying normal things don't matter. Everyone needs to be a missionary or something like that. But rather, what I'm trying to say is that in your nine to five job, in your day to day grind, Jesus being first is why you're here. You are in the job you're in, you're in the life you're in because Jesus put you there so you could serve him there. We need people who are in the medical field, the truck driving field, the repair field, you know? We need people there who love Jesus and their number one priority in life is to get to know Jesus better and live for him, whatever that looks like. That's what we need. And what the devil wants to do is draw you away from that, to get you distracted by other things and to make you lose your fire so that you can lose your reward. In Luke 12, there's this really interesting parable Jesus tells. He says, um, because Peter asks him, um, Jesus has been talking about all these things, and Peter asks him, who are you talking to? Are you talking to us or to everybody? And Jesus says, the servant, basically, he he asks it like a question, but I'll say it this way for it to make more sense. He says, the servant who is being faithful to give the other servants their food when they're supposed to get it, he will be blessed when his master comes back and finds him doing it. And basically what he's saying is, here's the servant who's got this boring job. He's the cook or something. He's supposed to give people their food when they're supposed to get it, right? Nothing exciting, nothing super amazing. He's a steward of a house. He's just giving people their food. But when the master comes back and finds that servant doing his job, he is going to be rewarded, right? And what Jesus is saying is, look, if you want to serve me, I want you to be faithful in the day-to-day things that I've called you to do. And when I come back, there's going to be a reward. You may not have an exciting, amazing, awesome life. It may just feel like a nine to five job. But what God wants is for you to be faithful and falling in love with Jesus more every day. Him being the number one priority. And when he comes back and finds you doing that, there will be a reward. What the devil wants to do is make you think your life doesn't matter. And it's not that big a deal. So that you will lose your reward. 
And so this is what I want to wrap up with. It's really a simple sermon. I tried to drag it out. But just want to encourage you guys to remember these things, that you're called to fight, that you can trust Jesus and know his love for you. And I want you to remember that there's a prize for being faithful to what God has called you to do, to keep in the main thing the main thing. That's how we finish well, is by remembering these things. And I want to encourage you this week to pray these things for yourself. God, help me not to get discouraged in the fight. Help me to know that I can trust you and your love. And help me to stay focused so that I can get the reward at the end. Pray that for me. Pray that for each other. Pray that for this church. That's what we need to finish well. Today and every year, you know, no matter what, what year we're in, these are things that will help us finish well. Amen? So let's pray. If, uh, John, you can come up. And I'd encourage you right now to pray these things for yourself. There may be some of us in here that are really struggling right now to believe that we can trust Jesus with whatever we're going through or to believe that God loves you. There may be some of us in here that have gotten distracted. I just want to encourage you to whatever it is to ask God to help you with that right now. If you need prayer, Scott or I would love to pray for you. And let's pray together that God would help us to finish well, not just start. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Lord, thank you that we can trust you. Lord, you know I've needed this sermon just as much as anybody else. Lord, it's hard for me to believe that you're always there and that you care. Lord, I want to be faithful. And I know so many of us in here want to be faithful, God. In the day-to-day, we want to live for you, to love you, to serve you. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to get into the fight and stay in it, to believe, God, that you love us and that we can trust you. Lord, help us to get the reward to be passionate about you, God. Pray, Lord, you would move in our church. Bless us in this way, in Jesus' name. Amen.